So the differential diagnosis, you know, essentially enhanced physiologic tremor, stress, um, Parkinson's disease, cerebellar stroke, uh, cerebellar outflow tremor can be related to stroke, tends to be a little bit more of a ballistic tremor with uh, less oscillatory and more kind of random motion associated with it. Drugs, metabolic induced tremor, dystonic tremor, and then Wilson's disease. And there's kind of a little uh, schematic that you can go through to try to work it out. But generally, it gets pretty obvious pretty quickly. Um, these are all the medications that are associated with enhanced uh, tremor. And so you really, first thing you have to do is go through their medication list and make sure that they're uh, not on something that's likely to be causing it. Um, so essential tremor uh, most often affects the hands, uh, but can also affect the head and the voice and even the torso and the legs as well, although that's much less common. Uh, most common thing really is the hands, arms, voice, and then head. Um, the, there is a certain frequency from 4 to 12 hertz. It tends to be faster in the younger population, and then as we get older, the oscillations slow down, uh, and it is in a, a seen in a bimodal distribution, so uh, there is a familial tremor that often will present very early, uh, and then uh, familial or sporadic tremor can present later in life. And um, it is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion in about half of patients, and it is sporadic about in the other half. So family history is incredibly important, but just because there is no family history doesn't mean they don't have essential tremor. And there are some environmental factors that I'll talk about. Um, it is the most common movement disorder, and uh, it is shockingly in up to 4% of patients over age 40. So that's really, really common. Uh, there is a very variable uh, kind of penetrance of the tremor, though. So most people have fairly mild tremor. Uh, only a fraction of those 4% are really candidates for what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and it is very, very commonly misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease. There are some environmental factors. Patients uh, with essential tremor have higher concentrations of these harmane proteins, and they're uh, often found in uh, meats that are cooked at high temperatures. Uh, so barbecue, uh, and then also with uh, wheat and rice. Uh, and there may be some sort of metabolic problem in processing these proteins in patients with essential tremor. Um, also, lead is found in higher concentrations in ET patients and people that have been exposed to chemicals in agricultural work and uh, glass, frosted glass, have been seen to be uh, higher, more likely to have essential tremor. Um, these are all the medications that are used, up to 20 different meds. Um, but as Zach was talking about, there really uh, are only two medications that have uh, level A efficacy besides alcohol, although <laughs> I don't think many people would, would treat with that, but um, primidone and propanolol. So anybody who has a central tremor really has to be tried on both of these medications before uh, moving on to anything else. And in my opinion, anything other than those two is probably going to um, be ineffective. And so I think that, you know, they often will try all the antiepileptics and um, all kinds of other meds that really are just not effective at all. Um, Ryder, do we know why only propranolol and not the other beta blockers? What is it about propranolol? Because clearly it's not a pure beta blocker effect. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, people think it's a metabolite that's broken down with propranolol and um, yeah, I don't. I've not seen any literature that that explains why atenolol or metoprolol. Uh, but it's true; they really have very, very little impact on tremor uh, compared to enderol. So uh, next, I'll talk about DBS because that's kind of a I would say the gold standard treatment today for essential tremor after medications have failed. It was approved for the use in essential tremor. DBS was approved for ET before it was approved for anything else back in 1997. Um, and uh, there's been probably, I think, more than 300,000 patients implanted now. Um, these are the three different targets that we typically use for ET, Parkinson's, and dystonia, uh, just uh, for your boards. Uh, VIM is the target for ET, and STN and GPI are the targets for Parkinson's, uh, and then globus pallidus is the only target for dystonia. The VIM nucleus is is really don't people don't know the etiology of ET. 
but we know that the VIM nucleus is inherently involved in the generation of the tremor. Uh, it's basically a major uh, relay station in the motor system. We get inputs from the spinal cord, inputs from the cerebellum, uh, inputs from the motor cortex. Uh, it's the primary input for joint and position receptors of the body. And so sort of knowing where your arm and leg is in space is, uh, is critically controlled through this region. And we know that when you record from cells in, this, in the VIM, the oscillations of the cells uh, are in phase with the oscillations of the arm and actually precede the arm. And then practically speaking, we know that when we destroy this nucleus, we arrest the tremor. Um, and so you can see here, uh, here's the internal capsule. Ooh, it was a don't step on there. Uh, here's the VIM nucleus. You can see there's a somatotopic organization of the nucleus. We're trying to get it really towards the hand area. So towards the back of the nucleus, right at the border of the VC uh, nucleus. So it's a very small target. We have about a two millimeter uh, radius that we're trying to hit uh, with the electrode. Um, the Medtronic has been the really only player in the field uh, up till about a year ago. Uh, these are the batteries that are typically used. We have a rechargeable uh, battery. We have a battery that runs two electrodes and a battery that runs, runs one electrode. We frequently do bilateral stimulation in patients with essential tremor, although it was only ever FDA approved for unilateral treatment uh, with Medtronic. Um, just in the last uh, year, like I said, St. Jude, which is now bought by Abbott, has a, a new DBS device that's just come on the market. Um, this has what's called a directional lead, and so you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, over the next couple of years. The other two companies are also making directional leads, and the idea is that um, if your electrode is not in the ideal portion of the VIM nucleus, you can change radially how the field is generated by turning on or off uh, individual contacts around the radius of the lead. So there's three contacts where there used to be one for the Medtronic here and here as well. So you can see that the field is projected anteriorly, left, right, posteriorly, depending upon which of the cathodes you turn on uh, at a given time. So the idea is that we'll be able to uh, steer the current away from the internal capsule, steer the current away from VC, where people get a lot of paresthesias, uh, and direct it towards the ideal portion uh, of the VIM nucleus. Uh, we typically do the surgery. I use a frame. Uh, there are frameless-based uh, approaches as well. Uh, I think Virtual uses Next Frame, which is a frameless approach. Uh, today. Uh, we typically put in the electrode in one surgery and then put in the pulse generator in a second surgery. Uh, surgical related complications include hemorrhage, a very commonly transient confu confusion if you implant bilaterally. So I don't implant bilaterally. I implant one side at a time and then come back and do the other side later. Uh, and obviously infection. Uh, Robert, how long is that interval between birth and central so we put the lead in uh, and then put the battery in typically one week later for the first side, and then we program that and get it to work well, and then talk about making sure it's helping them, then talk about the other side. It's typically three months between the first side and the second side. Um, there are places that put them in all at the same time, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the answer is yes, there are side effects that can occur with uh, ablation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But the question is whether it's ablating the VIM that's causing the side effects or whether you're spreading that ablation into nearby structures that are causing the side effects. But obviously, it did, does something. Well, it's not normally an oscillatory generator. It's a coordination um, 
nucleus. And so it's basically feeding joint position information to the motor pathways and the cerebellar pathways to modify uh, opposing muscle groups. So you want to relax the triceps when you uh, contract the biceps. That coordination of doing them seamlessly is presumably done in the VAM nucleus. When something goes wrong and there's a little bit, you know, information on one side is getting there later than the other, then all of a sudden you're kind of, you know, doesn't know what's going on in a seamless fashion. And that's when you get this kind of reverberatory uh, oscillatory tremor. Um, so there are also stimulation-related side effects related to, again, the nearby structures. You can get pulling, you can get eye movements, you can get uh, usually thickening of the tongue is a very common one, uh, and you can get balance problems from um, stimulating too much. And so really the paresthesias, uh, thickening tongue, and balance problems are the three most common side effects with DBS and the other uh, things that I'll talk about. There's actually very good literature looking at the uh, efficacy for DBS. The um, American Academy of Neurology looked in 2005 and then again in 2011 and concluded that it has level C uh, evidence that it is possibly effective. They're a very conservative group, the AAN, um, but they are recommending it for use in medically refractory limb tremor. Um, and they say up to from a 60 to 90 percent reduction in contralateral limb. Um, there's another study, 97 and 2003, showing that there's good both short-term and long-term efficacy, although there is um, loss of efficacy over time. It's not clear that it's habituation to the uh, stimulation or whether it's uh, disease uh, modification and worsening that's that's uh, accounting for that. Clearly, though, the settings tend to need to go up over time, so more amplitude of stimulation to get the same tremor control. Um, there is also good uh, evidence for head tremor control with bilateral DBS, not with unilateral DBS. And again, the most common side effects are dysarthria, paresthesias, dystonia, balance, ataxia, and weakness. Uh, next, I'll talk about Gamma Knife. Gamma Knife uh, was really invented to uh, perform functional procedures, including thalamotomy uh, by Lars Lexell. Um, it's 201 beams of cobalt source gamma rays that are focused on essentially about a four millimeter uh, spherical diameter. Uh, and we point that at the VIM nucleus, which is the uh, green circles that you can see here. There's a relatively sharp drop off, um, but there can be uh, sort of effects that spread. One of the problems with, with Gamma Knife is that there's not an incredibly predictable response to radiation. Some people have a little bit less, some people have more, so it's hard to know exactly what the sphere uh, of damage is going to be. Um, the benefits are that no surgery is needed, only one treatment, minimal follow-up, uh, you don't have to come off of anticoagulation, and uh, most people will, will get a, an effect within six months. Risks are that it is a lesional procedure. Uh, you, if you have side effects, they're going to be permanent. Um, and most people would say you should not treat bilaterally. There are some centers who do treat bilaterally, but it is not recommended by the AAN. Um, in terms of efficacy, there's a number of studies done, uh, both the Pittsburgh group and the group here with Ron Young. Uh, before he left, or the uh, two uh, groups that are published most often. Basically, this table nine here is from uh, Ron Young's paper showing that there was a 78% tremor-free rating at 12 months and 70% tremor-free at 48 months. That's really better than most of the other literature for anything else. Um, this was in 52 patients back in 2000, uh, but it was not a blinded study and uh, uh, there was no sham group. So um, I would say that the, the literature is a little bit more up in the air. There's another study done in 2010 um, with the Toronto group and they did 14 patients with blinded assessments pre and post gamma knife and showed that there's actually no improvement in tremor, statistical improvement in resting tremor, postural tremor, action tremor, or anything other than ADLs. There wasn't a statistically valid improvement in ADLs, but that was it. So the literature is kind of all over the place when it comes to gamma knife. 
Uh, Dr. Wood, question. Yeah. For those patients that have the tremor come back, maybe, have you ever uh, retreated them with another course of gamma knife down, down the line? Uh, yes, I have not, but uh, the, the group does, and um, they, they will do that uh, only if they look and find that the target was not hit. So if it's too high, too low, if there's a reason to think that the real target remains, that I have seen them go back again. Uh, but typically, we then send the patients for DBS if, if that's the case. Uh, next is focused ultrasound. Um, this is kind of the new player on the market. Uh, we've been involved in the pivotal trial here um, as one of the uh, six centers. Basically, it's marrying the concept of the gamma knife where you have multiple sources of energy that all cross in one space uh, with uh, the MRI technology to be able to visualize what's happening in an immediate uh, time point. There's something called MRI thermography that allows us to, in one, in one plane at least, uh, at a time, look exactly what the uh, temperature map is across that plane and see with a very high degree of accuracy uh, how much the temperature is raising and exactly where. And that allows us to make a real-time lesion testing the entire time uh, clinically to make sure that there are no side effects and that there's a good clinical outcome. So the advantages are that it's more accurate with a higher drop-off and uh, shorter distance than gamma knife. You're able to do intraoperative targeting. You can sculpt a lesion so it's not doesn't have to be spherical. You can actually do sequential lesioning to make it um, uh, aspherical. Um, it uh, is a closed loop therapy where we can do an iterative process. We can do it once. Uh, we can raise the temperature of the tissue to a non-lethal temperature, but one in which the tissue won't be active. And so at about 45 degrees centigrade, it should no longer work for a short period of time. We can look for tremor control, look for side effects, and then progress to higher temperatures uh, once we know that the target is a safe one. And so you can see here, this is kind of the, the, the circle of the therapy where we're targeting. You can see the MRI thermography. Um, we're measuring in near real time uh, as we're uh, sending the energy into the skull. You can see typically at about 9 to 13 seconds is how long we do our each sonication. And you can look at the temperature. We then look and see how their uh, spirals are doing, look for any side effects and then go back and do it again and sequentially increase the energy. Um, this, there was a study at UVA that really demonstrated the pilot uh, that it was uh, a potentially good idea. They did 15 patients and found 62% improvement in, tre in tremor at three months uh, bilaterally, but 75% on the treated side. Uh, there were nine patients that had some degree of paresthesia afterwards, uh, only one that had any um, sort of ongoing unpleasantness in the, in the paresthesia. And you can see here is the lesion that is made. There's kind of three zones. There's the necrotic core, uh, there's the penumbra, and then there's the swelling that is uh, reversible afterwards. And you can see the lesion size itself changes over time. Uh, by three months, the lesion size is very small, less than a millimeter, and the, uh, most people believe that that uh, zone of necrosis basically fills in uh, from the tissue expanding around it. Um, so we then went on to a pivotal study based on that pilot study. Uh, there were 72 patients enrolled. This was a sham controlled uh, one to three uh, compared to uh, treatment arm, and then looked at three months, six months, and 12 months. Patients who got the sham procedure could cross over and have the real procedure three months afterwards, but they ended up having to go through it twice, uh, which is, was not very pleasant because they had to have their head shaved each time. And, um, and it's about a three to four hour procedure in the MRI scanner, not, not easy to go through. Um, here's the primary uh, outcome results here. This is the CRST or clinical rating score for tremor. It's a composite score of three different uh, sort of assessments of tremor. Uh, there's the postural tremor. There's sort of activities like pouring uh, and spirals. And then there's activities of daily living as well, dressing, that kind of thing. And in the composite score, you can see there was a statistically significant uh, decrease in their tremor score up to 12 months out, although you could see there is a slight 
tendency towards uh, recurrence uh, along the way. And here you can see that this is from the pilot study uh, patient both pre and post uh, treatment with their Archimedes spirals. There was improvements in disability, improvements in quality of life that were seen, um, and uh, there were also side effects seen. So uh, just like DBS, there are paresthesias and balance problems were the two biggest ones. Two people did have taste disturbance so that nobody could really figure out why, um, but uh, clearly balance and paresthesias were the most common. Um, this is just looking at the part A of the tremor score, which was uh, the postural uh, tremor and kinetic tremor. And there was about a 70% reduction in this group. And you could see that the people that were initially treated with sham and then crossed over actually did better than the people who got it right up front. Uh, most people think that there was a little bit of a learning effect with the centers as time went on. So the people that got the sham um, were uh, got a more experienced treatment by the time they were treated for real. Um, but again, they're statistically significant at 12 months out. Um, we did have to include three failed treatments in the outcome analysis. So if you took those out, the, the tremor rating improvement would probably be more akin to what we see with DBS. But you know, once they got in the scanner, we had to put them in the intention to treat uh, group. And so even though one patient had skull that was too thick to be able to get the energy through, we still had to look at her outcome scores. Uh, we did find out through this trial that there were people that were that are ineligible for focused ultrasound because of the uh, anatomy of their skull. Either it's too thick or it's too corrugated. So the ultrasound waves basically either are absorbed or reflected more in some patients than in others. And so we basically can't achieve a target temperature in some patients due to those characteristics. And uh, there were patients that simply could not lie flat for long enough uh, to have the treatment done. So essentially, it was uh, approved by the FDA in uh, July of last year. Um, there is an ongoing study. There's, there was an open label study that has closed now. And there's a post-market study that is going on as well. But uh, clearly, it is effective at least up to a year out. This is much better level of evidence than we even have for DBS because of the quality of the study that was done um, and really Gamma Knife and DBS have not gone through the kind of scrutiny that this study did for focused ultrasound. So I, I think it's a pretty good result in the end. Um, and we had a, the last patient in our uh, study was a guy from Georgia, and um, he was so happy uh, to be included. Uh, he wanted to have the whole thing filmed. So we kind of made a story about him, uh, and I wanted to show that here. Uh, the uh, Swedish Foundation uh, put this together, and I can I can hold it, <laughs> but it'll start back, and then the doctors want you to do this, and this one just don't want to cooperate, but then. Bring your nose over here, I'll stick my finger on your nose and you see if I can poke you in the eye or not. <laughs>
focused ultrasound is a brand new therapy where we can combine MRI technology uh, to image what's happening inside the brain with a focused ultrasound to be able to basically um, raise the temperature in very small parts of the brain to deliver therapies. It's, uh, it's really exciting for me because, uh, you know, as a neurosurgeon, we're used to opening the head and going into the brain and providing our treatment. And uh, it can be very effective, but it's very, very invasive. This technology is, is you know, kind of miraculous because we can treat lesions or problems that are inside the brain without ever going into the brain physically. This is a game changer, I hope. I've got all the hopes in the world. I've got plenty of people on my side. For almost all of my patients, this is a huge kind of fork in the road for their future. And I never lose sight of that fact. People um, can be very transformed from having significant disabilities and really tough uh, daily life to having a really great quality of life in a matter of hours. I don't know why I'm nervous. I'm just ready to see, see him, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So let me go back and look at it again. That small difference maker. Might be finished here. Did it work? It worked. <laughs> it worked. Okay. Now we're opening up a whole new world of potential new therapies for patients who have chronic neurologic conditions. So spasticity with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, patients who have epilepsy. So this is just a really exciting time to realize that we have a tool that is you know, minimally invasive and now we know it's very effective for at least one condition and now we can start applying it and seeing how it works with other conditions. You know, we're on the a brink of a whole new frontier of treating uh, neurological problems. You want to tell them? Hey, it worked. It worked. Yep. I love you. Touch my nose like you did before. Wow. Pull it, poke your eye out. <laughs> probably about a 90-95% reduction and that's typically what we see with all of these interventions. To my knowledge, none of them take away tremor completely, but they can make a huge, huge difference. So, all right, thanks.